All right, let's welcome everyone to the pandemic version of the Levin podcast. So we are all sitting at home for this Levin podcast. I am Kristen Blazek, coordinator of student recruitment for the College of Urban Affairs, and I would like uh, to introduce, I've got two guests today. I've got Dr. Nicholas Zangali and Dr. Sasha Dresgek. And uh, this is the first international podcast, so we are actually going international today. Uh, and we're also going to various parts in uh, Cleveland and greater Northeast Ohio. So welcome to the podcast. I would... I would also like to, uh, in, in case this isn't video, uh, I would like to uh, introduce Molly Snoke, who's here as well. Hi, Molly. Hi. <laughs> All right, so today uh, we're going to be talking about smart cities, but first I want to hear a little background from my two guests. So Dr. Zingali, if you could start with a little bit of who you are, a little bit of your background, and what you're doing currently. Okay, good. Thanks, Kristen. Gl uh, glad to be here. Um, I've been a professor at Cleveland State now for around 10 years, been teaching in higher ed for, uh, I think last I checked, it's something like 26 years. Um, so my work uh, is primarily in the area of um, ur urban areas and cities. My interest is in governance related issues, uh, I guess at the surface, but more fundamentally, I'm interested in the way that people's um, own individual experiences translate into how we understand government working and government functioning. Uh, that is associated with something called phenomenology. Um, but this idea of phenomenology is the way in which our own lived experiences are interpreted and understood by us. Um, not so much by others, but by us and how that creates meaning for us when we experience the city. Um, uh, obviously, with the onset of technology and enhanced technology within cities, uh, this has a, uh, will have, and already having a dramatic impact on the way people experience the city. Um, just like this podcast, this pandemic, these, there's these things from the outside that come in and they impinge upon our own personal experiences um, and we translate them in different ways. So I've gotten involved with smart cities through something called the Internet of Things Collaborative which is a collaborative between Case Western Reserve University and Cleveland State University. And we have been wrestling with and working on various projects in the area that I hope to get to and talk about um, regarding uh, technology within the city. Awesome. Sasha? Uh, thank you. Well, I'm an um, associate professor from the University of Rijeka. And I'm in academia basically from 202. And from the start, I'm involved in uh, local government issues from development and financing, which basically led to, um, to my, uh, my latest um, uh, setting of uh, Center for Support to Smart and Sustainable Cities, which was sort of natural direction of uh, the development of, of basically theory and conception of, um, I would say not only local economic development, but national development. Because smart city is not just concept, which is um, in a way local, but it's pretty much global. So um, besides academia, I was also in involved in a lot of uh, practical projects, mainly in the field of application of different kinds of public-private partnership projects, uh, which are mostly related to use of new technology within cities. And uh, actually that kind of mix of academia and practical experiences, I think gave me a lot of uh, knowledge about, um, I would say, con contemporary problems of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, conceptualizing, but also implementation of smart cities. Awesome. Awesome. So that's a great segue into we're going to be talking about smart cities. So can we start with what is a smart city? Any one of us? <laughs> Any, anybody. Go what, for what it. Is, yeah, just go for it. I'll what is a smart city? <laughs> uh, and then quickly go over to Sasha because Sasha 
uh, uh, is primarily leading a paper that him and I have been um, tinkering around with for some time that gets after this question in more explicit detail. So I'll just kind of draw it conceptually here and then Sasha, maybe you can jump in and talk a little bit about the paper and where you're heading with that. So when you think about um, a smart city, um, I think the way to think about it is from a conceptual framework. So it, it is not necessarily um, a thing that can be defined clearly at the edges. Um, instead, it's more of this concept. And this concept is about building a technological ecosystem within the city from which data and information can be um, garnished, gathered, and in real time, um, and, and be able to transfer that data in efficiently and an effective way so that the information can be processed, converged with other sources of data, manipulated in some way, and then kicked back out either to other devices or to human beings in the process of making decisions. So let me give you a real quick example of that, okay? A simple example. I'm driving around the city and I can't find a parking spot, okay? In today's day and age, a, a non-smart city, I have to drive around and look for that particular parking spot. But in a city that has implemented a smart city parking program, um, I might have an app that's open on my phone and that the open parking spots are constantly sensing that there is not either a car there or not a car there. It's sending it to an information system, information communication system. That's spe speaking to my mobile phone or my mobile device and it's directing me where those open parking spots might be. So I can be more efficient about part, you, uh, finding a parking spot that best fits my needs. I mean, we'll get into more examples as we, as we go forward. Okay, okay. And are there any cities that are smart at this point? So I, I, I would maybe reflect on, on, on Nick's uh, conceptualization and also uh, example. Um, it, it is interesting that actually uh, so far uh, in terms of um, sort of perspective on uh, different uh, smart cities and implementations of smart city programs, um, you cannot find like the sort of like the, you know, like the ideal smart city. What is very, very us uh, usual is that uh, cities are actually um, using some kind of different solutions made by vendors so for example they have different uh, smart parking solutions um, or, or some other uh, other projects but I, I would say this is still like the early beginning of development of the smart city because if if we think about uh, about smart city uh, in terms of uh, conceptual meaning it has to be like much broader or broader concept in sense that actually um, with a smart city, we are, we are actually uh, targeting, I, I could even say that the objective function is welfare of certain city. So if you're talking, for example, of uh, in example of smart parking, so this is very good example of how to make uh, parking more efficient. But uh, in, in the wider sense, we, are, we have to think about means of transportation, we have to uh, think about uh, kind of uh, spatial solutions within the city. So the, the, about, about the fact, do we, for example, do we need cars in the city? So uh, of course this depends on, on different features of the particular city, whether the city is large, whether the city is like a middle size or it's a small city. So basically this is much more complex when it comes to, uh, to practical solutions when we, when we go from theory to, to implementation. So what you're talking about is sort of the management and operations of a city. And Nick, the example you gave is kind of the user experience, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. how so, do those two things are at odds sometimes in an urban space? Yeah, so let, let me um, kind of um, answer it in this way and, and tying back to where Kristen was going with her question on uh, whether or not there are smart cities. Um, so I, I think what, um, what we see mainly is that most cities, particularly most cities in developing countries, are on the path to becoming smart. 
um, it, what they have is a repertoire or a um, uh, uh, kind of a, a fabric or a matrix of smart city projects. And as these smart city projects begin to coalesce and connect and bump into one another, you begin to see more of this pragmatic approach towards a smart city or this concept of what we mean by a smart city. Now, that's kind of working from the bottom up. And that's where we tend to see a lot of cities at right now is they are, because it's relatively new, because oftentimes these projects are being led by available technology, we see these technological experiments happening within cities where we're playing around with these projects. And then we're asking a question like, what should this mean for us? How do we better manage this? How do we begin to conceptualize this at a larger level? Um, and so we, we see kind of this bottom up approach going on. Now, when you look at some of the indices that start to rank smart cities, they rank them by those projects that are going on. And so they start to look at well, what are these individual projects? Do they have something nifty going on? When you pay attention to other indices, such as like the smart governance uh, indice that exists out there, they tend to work from the top down more along what Mo Molly was talking about and what Sasha was, was uh, alluding to. They begin to look at things like do you have a smart city strategic plan? Do you have leadership that's ready? How are, are, is your talent ready? Is your talent pool being involved on that? Uh, do you have mechanisms and policies in place so that you can have, um, um, you're not having a digital divide that gets created or exacerbated by what's, what's currently going on? When you look at from that top down level, the smart city indices tends to focus on cities that already have good management structures in place so you start to see cities like uh, uh, London and Seoul and Singapore and New York, those tend to rank up a bit higher with that smart city indice and then come down into the smaller types of cities. I will mention there is one city in Columbus that hits, uh, one city in, in Ohio that hits the top 25 and it's Columbus uh, using the smart city governance index. Uh, but that's not to sell, uh, sell Cleveland short. There's a lot going on in Cleveland and I hope to get around to the different activities that are happening happening here. Well, so, I mean, that that's one of the questions we wanted to ask both of you, which is what would it take for Cleveland and Rieka to become a smart city? Where are we at um, and, and what's needed to push us along that spectrum? If, if I can, if I can for example, give you a couple of examples. Um, so uh, one of the reasons uh, why we were actually, why we founded the Center for to support the, the smart and sustainable cities was our perception that basically Rijeka, which, uh, which actually got a grant for becoming a smart city, this is a grant from uh, European funds, and where many, many partners are involved, and city, city of Rijeka is in charge, and there are many, many projects that are within this kind of umbrella. But what, what we observed is exactly what Nick mentioned, is that um, mostly all of these projects are made bottom up. So these, these projects are uh, propositions from different vendors or, or uh, suppliers or, 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 or companies that provide services that actually uh, there's, no, there's no kind of visible construct of the, of the future smart city. So that's why we were setting this, this kind of uh, academic sort of the, the, the center, which, would, which should actually provide support in terms of strategical thinking, uh, modeling of the smart city, um, organization, and as well as implementation and uh, different financing options. So uh, what we believe that without this kind of approach, we will, we will always remain in the level of like, piloting different kinds of projects and uh, without much opportunities to scale up uh, successful projects. Um, also, um, I, I will not uh, mention uh, this city, but uh, very recently, before, of course, uh, pandemia, I had, uh, we had a guest uh, which uh, gave a lecture on one of the top smart cities in Europe. And, um, you know, he was telling about examples and, and concept of the city. And I, I was in that city and I asked him, uh, I was in the city and I didn't, I didn't feel or, or saw anything smart. <laughs> and what he said is actually, 
<laughs> actually neither did I <laughs> so that was that was very funny so whatever when you mention different kind of cities like Barcelona or, or Rome or, or, or some European uh, cities which are leading in terms of uh, smart uh, smart uh, concepts and technologies um, when I look at those uh, examples uh, it's still mostly based on different kind of uh, sort of like the project which projects which are successful and and prominent so the, the answer uh, to, to your question and both for Cleveland and for Rijeka I think is that without this kind of transformation from the bottom up towards sort of like uh, I would say even semi-structural functional approach so bottom up projects connected with some kind of let's say governance structure, we will not be able to actually uh, conceptualize and implement functional smart cities. Is this an initiative that, because you're talking about management and you're talking about bottom up, is this an initiative that is solely up to management to be in charge of? Or is this going to have to be a partnership between private organization and the public? Because I know, you know, there are apps right now that kind of help out with, with different aspects to, to what you're talking about to make a city almost smart. But it almost seems like, you know, which one, like the chicken and the egg, which one comes first? Is it the public sector that is going to take the lead on this or is it going to be the private sector that needs to take the lead on this? Yeah, so if I can, I, this is an excellent question and uh, one that, um, I'm going to answer, uh, I'll get to, but I want to, I want to draw on people's imagination a little bit because I think, I think what we tend to think about right now with smart cities because of where we're contained and what we can reach and touch are these little projects, lighting projects, uh, the shotgun projects that are able to detect when a gunfire, uh, the, the mobility projects of good smart apps that get you around a city, uh, the signage projects, um, even the wearing of the personal devices, the COVID-19 uh, thing has had, uh, if you look in China, they're wearing wristbands or rings that are they're constantly monitoring, biometrically monitoring people. So you can, you can, they can map out with people, fevers and those types of things, right? So there, there are these really innovative things going on, but uh, these activities that are happening tend to be opportunistic based on what, uh, what or who has the technology um, at that particular time. But what I want to draw people's um, uh, of thoughts to is a little bit more of an imaginative approach so that we could begin to think about what a city might look like into the future. So uh, imagine, imagine a place, um, imagine a work environment in which you don't physically go to any space to do work, almost like what we're doing right now. But yet the Zoom interface is one in which we are able to actually um, see, touch, smell one another in a more sophisticated way, okay? Um, where we could almost be anywhere at any time doing anything, right? So if I want to experience what it's like to be surfing in the ocean right now, I could potentially go there. If I want to be able to feel like what it's like to be a machine operator in Nevada, right, wearing, working on a CNC, I, could, I can hone my skills and be that machine operator and be able to send my, my skill set electronically to a robot or some other type of mechanism that's actually working on the floor. Right? Start to think much more um, um, progressively about what this technology affords us within a smart city. And then we get to this question of what ought to be the role of government? What ought to be the role of the private sector? What ought to be the role of the nonprofit sector? We don't have very good questions for this right now. And the reason for that is we haven't answered a fundamental question in this. And that is, what ought to be the impact or how we begin to understand humanity or the human being as this technology impinges upon us? And what should be those mechanisms that we use to get at that? I have a diagram that I use um, quite a bit on this thing that begins to look at the conceptual that asks big questions like, what do we want life to look and feel like into the future? Mm -hmm. Contextual, what ought to be the constitutional or the uh, broad principles that we begin to live by? And then something called contextual. And the contextual starts to answer the questions like, what are the things we ought to be doing? Um, 
the public, private, nonprofit sector, and, and, and individuals at large in a interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approaches have to wrestle with all three of those. So if any one of those entities begins to take a lead, they start, they could misinterpret it, where we're going, what it ought to mean, and what impact we ought to have, and we can find ourselves in, in, in a sticky place, in a place we don't want to be, uh, surveillance state, so on and so forth. To, maybe to address, address your question in terms of, uh, of, the, of the governance and, and, uh, and sort of like the new models of uh, functioning, I would say that the new technology actually enables changes, changes in traditional ways of how government actually uh, function. And especially if you're talking about uh, different tiers of government, and now we're mostly talking about local government. Because um, in, in, in many examples, a local government uh, acted in a way as a silo, in a way that um, after elections, they, they just uh, ran the local community based on some kind of perspective. And there was not much part participation of the citizens. Um, basically, uh, there, there were different concepts of participation, but they were, in a way, um, there was a lot of obstacles for, for a number of citizens to participate. And now with technology, they can participate immensely in many ways in, in different kinds of um, concepts. And so, in a way that the governments can be conducive to all, the, all these changes that, for example, the some kind of government can, uh, can use much more uh, referenda for different kinds of projects. So, for example, um, we, all, we already had this kind of decision-making uh, processes in, in, in history, but it was much harder to pursue them. And today, you can have it online. On a, on a web platform, you can have like information of different kinds of projects, and the citizens can vote on, on this project, whether they want them or not. So in a way, we are, we are basically, uh, we are closing this kind of government and governance to a more participatory framework. So I would say that this is an interactive process where uh, we all have to learn uh, the use of application of technology, which is available. I think I still think that the technology is not not even close used as as uh, is, as it could be uh, in terms of uh, making making uh, making uh, results of the of the of the of the government uh, better in terms of the citizens well, citizens welfare. Of course, it's not always the best to pursue what what uh, taxpayers uh, want. But it has to be sort of like a mixture between technical solutions and also participatory framework. But that gets to the to the point that it's not the technology itself that makes that happen. Governments, the public sector still has to value that level of participation and actively seek that, right? And so those mechanisms have to be put in place. And that seems to be absent in so many smart city related activities. Nick, you know, we're looking at smart city parks in an east side neighborhood of the city of Cleveland in, in Huff that has traditionally um, been, uh, you know, a vulnerable population in the city, right? And so to actively seek their input about what happens in their space and not just assuming that smart parks and smart technology is something that they want right and we talked about building in citizen participation and it's not just the existence of the technology that makes that happen that has to be uh, core to the strategies that you implement in smart city related uh, projects or initiatives mm -hmm. yes yeah, so, so this is um what you're hitting on here is we start to think, you know, I look at the lens of this for people who are working in government or working for government or along with government. And that, I guess this would extend to the private and the public sector as well. Um, when we begin to look at these technology projects, at least the ones that I've been involved with, um, they are, uh, there's multiple um, entities that touch these projects. And for them to be successful, they have to be collaborative. Um, and so, honing in on our ability to be able to collaborate and work with others and share ideals, uh, ideas with others, I think becomes a strategic um, uh, operational mechanism for these technologically related projects. 
I think one of the things I'm seeing right now when we, when we start to spin out these technology projects is they tend to be tech-led projects. And so the tech-led projects tend to be the people who are most, into, most tied into the technology and they're spinning this thing out and implementing this project. And what's coming afterwards is citizen input. And I think what you're saying, Molly, which I agree with is, and what we're trying to do in Huff, is get the citizens involved at the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. So they're invested in the way the technology is being designed before it gets deployed. So we're not just experimenting on cities, we're working with cities and residents in a collaborative way so that the deployment meets the needs of what that, what that individual group or what that individual neighborhood, uh, is, what's most important to them. Yes. I think that citizen participation from the onset is critical. I would also, I would add also importance of, uh, of data. So now we're, we're, we're actually, uh, we have abilities to collect more and more data. So it's a, it's a trend of, of, of so-called big data. But I don't think we still have ways and means how to present that data to different stakeholders. To citizens, to 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 companies, to to any kind of stakeholders. So, uh, the, the one of the questions is, is basically what different stakeholders want. And uh, I would say this is also an iterative process because um, I think they, their kind of perception and, and desires change based on inputs. So if there, you know, if you ask some taxpayer what he wants from the cities, he will have uh, very often, like I would say median, median taxpayer or citizen, I would say maybe it's better to use the word citizen, will, will knows actually um, his knowledge on, on basically on the functions uh, of cities are maybe limited. He is not aware of all options or all uh, even legal activities that the city can it has to do that, but when he receives information about different kinds of uh, responsibilities of the city, uh, different kinds of uh, possibilities which are uh, available from technology, from services and so on, I, I believe that he will change his perspective and he will change preferences. So I would say that's sort of this kind of big data framework, framework but also means and tools for presenting and which means also part of the transparency process is extremely important in further development and this is ongoing process this is not static this is some kind of dynamic process which leads to uh, building up of capacities of state stakeholders of the city and with stakeholders necessarily city has to improve in many ways so let me get, I'd like to give a practical example of what, to what Sasha has been saying, because I think he's right on with what he's, he's talking about and it relates to the question you asked, Molly. So let's take, let's take something we want from the city. Like we, we, we hear from residents all the time that we want safe streets. We want a safe city, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, this is, the, uh, the, this is the conceptual idea we want, is a safe city. But um, using technology to be able to do this could mean a variety of things to a variety of different people. So we could make an ultra safe, safe city by making a surveillance state city where everybody is surveilled at all times. We're watching everybody. We're gathering copious amounts of data. We can tell where you are at at any one point in time and what you're doing and we can trace people back. Okay. Um, the trade-off of, of, of this for that level of safety is that we give up a large degree of privacy and we give ourselves into this kind of surveillance state that's going on. The reason why we have to have multiple disciplines involved with these technological kind of activities is that it's not just about building a smart city for safety, but Sasha and I talk about it all the time, it's about, and Molly, is, it's about building a sensible city. So how do we have both a smart and sensible place? Smart being we're optimizing the technology, but a sensible place in that we're still optimizing what our social and societal beliefs are and maintaining that level uh, or that degree of freedom that we'd like to have within our community. That gets answered in different ways in different communities at different times. And that's what makes this, this, these types of initiatives particularly difficult. 
Um, because when you have to design a technology that isn't just bifurcated to ultra surveillance or no surveillance, but somewhere in between the algorithms and the data manipulation and the data gathering becomes infinitely more difficult because now you're de dealing with ambiguous terms. Exactly. I would, I would just reflect to what Nick said. Um, I would say there are two ways of using technology. So first one in terms of usual concept of smart city is like boost efficiency. So for example, if you, if you replace uh, mercury bulbs with, uh, with the LED bulbs, what did you do? It's, it's, it's optimal in terms of efficiency and better quality and so on. But if you use technology in order to invent new service, in order to uh, provide some kind of uh, new way of uh, living pattern to the community. So it means basically you're using technology to boost welfare in a much, much greater way. So I would say here in the first concept, actually, you are, you're hitting the uh, efficiency. But uh, on the second concept, you're actually targeting effectiveness. So that means you're, you're boosting development with technology. And this is basically, uh, I would say, the concept more, more um, appropriate to sensible cities. Because what, 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 is it, what is important about sensible cities? You're thinking about welfare. So you're, you're not thinking about technical efficiency. You're think, thinking what is good for the people. Well, there's going, to be, <clears throat> there's going to be some projects or initiatives where the results are going to be invisible to the residents who they benefit, right? There's, whether it's utility regulation or, um, you know, the utilities along the street, Nick, you know, we're talking about E66. And then there's going to be some that, like a smart parking app or the ability to, um, you know, all the lighting that the city of Cleveland is replacing in, in, in its light posts that will be more um, a direct impact or something that can be seen, right? And at what point um, is it of greater consideration that it's related to the user experience or the management of something that sort of becomes invisible, right? You said you walked in, Sasha, you, you went to a city, you didn't feel it was very smart. Well. I've been some places too, right? But maybe a lot of that is just invisible to you. It's unseen. Mm -hmm. And how does, right, how does that play into um, where we started off, which was what does a smart city look like? Yeah. You're, you're right in that sense. I mean, if you're, looking, if you're looking about infrastructure, most of infrastructure is visible. Some, some of it, it's not. For example, we are still we are still not ready for the I would say boom in terms of smart city. Um, I hope with the uh, wider application of 5G technologies, we'll, we we are we will be ready because we still have like uh, tedious problems with communication with the broadband speed. Uh, even uh, even it's, if it's difficult still to organize different conferencing and, 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 and many issues. These things are invisible but are probably much more important than some visible things like, uh, like um, uh, street lighting or, 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 or this, kind of, uh, this kind of visible issues. I, I would say that both, both, uh, uh, both issues are important, of course, uh, in, in especially if we are talking about um, political importance. Uh, the, the golden rule is that, that the, the one who gets elect, elected actually uh, implements visible problems, visible projects. That's sometimes a huge problem because politicians actually are, of course, focused on the short term and they, they would like that citizens see their results. And what do they see? They see large buildings, they see uh, street lightning and, and so on. But very often invisible, like you said, invisible projects are far more important. For example, I believe that we lack many, many soft projects which are related to new technology. For example, we are lacking different kind of uh, funding platforms, uh, investment planning platforms, participatory platforms, all, all these kind of platforms which are based on knowledge, which are based on uh, participation and cooperation and collaboration between private, public sector and different other stakeholders are lacking. And this is, these are means for development. 
So, but I would say this is much, much uh, harder to implement because when we are talking about usual um, routines in, in smart city, and this is usually like a communal economy, communal infrastructure, that's easy. That's like traditional business. What is difficult? Difficult is like to, to use new technologies in a way that actually inspire businesses and new project uh, innovative concepts and incentives. This is difficult. And uh, I, I would say we need to put more accent on these kind of, these kind of projects. All right. So um, on that note, what I want to do is I want to... Um, <clears throat> I want to thank you guys. We're going to continue this conversation in a second part. So it'll be a part two to this because I want to talk about in part two, the next question that I'm going to be asking for part two is going to be talking about smart cities and where we're going to go from here now that we are in this pandemic. Um, I So I'm going to stop it here. Thank you guys so much. And we're going to pick it back up for part two. So everyone stay tuned for part two.